You're watching a message from Connect Church of Jacksonville. Find us online at connectchurchjacks.org. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, just ask you to bless this word and let the word uh, bring back fruit and let it um, find a place to rest. May our hearts be prepared with the worship this morning. Um, to receive it and let it actually get deep into our hearts. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. So um, I apologize. We're not going to have um, the Fandango video stuff because I didn't get it uh, time to put it together. Literally, I walked over here with it this morning. So um, so I apologize for that. So we have to do it the old-fashioned way. If you have your Bibles, you have to chase with me. So I will give you some time to go there. So right now, go ahead and get Jeremiah 29 ready. Um, and we'll give you a bit of time to do that. If not, what I would encourage you to do is use the pen and paper uh, in your seat and write down the scripture references and go back afterwards and kind of check me and make sure that, uh, you know, I was being truthful. Nothing wrong with that, right? Um, but one of the things, you know, we've been in a series about breaking the chains and, and how do you uh, live a victorious life, and we know that these chains that uh, Pastor Kelly has brought up here... Um, they can serve a good purpose, but they also can serve a bad purpose in that they can bind you, and they're very, very difficult to break. Um, and then depending on what the purpose of the chains are as to what, you know, what they do. So what we're talking about today is something that is probably, for me, the greatest challenge that I've faced. Um, so if nothing else, I'm preaching to you directly from experience and from my heart, and I'm going to let you know right off the bat, just because I preach this message of breaking the chains um, of your past doesn't mean that I've conquered all, uh, but I know who has, and that's who I've put my trust in. So, um, you know, we all, if you've lived uh, any length of time to where you have the ability to remember, you can have a past, and that past can be good. There can be good things in your past you look back on and remember. There could be great fishing trips. There could be great vacations. Um, there could be great jobs where you had a wonderful job and things were wonderful there. Um, all of those things, there can be great things in our past. But somehow or another, in this life that we live, and I don't know what it is that does it to us, but how often do we put more emphasis and have more um, feelings around those things in our past that hurt us? You ever notice that, that, that they tend to have, you know, when, when a phone call comes from your boss and you've been unceremoniously let go from a previous workplace and you're a hard, diligent worker and all of a sudden the phone rings and the boss needs you, does your first thought go to something negative or does it go to, oh, he's calling me to give me a promotion? Well, I would submit that you probably are thinking, uh-oh, you start checking, right? Okay, I did that right, I got that report in, I did this right, so I should be okay, let me see what he wants. And most of the times, it's something simple, it's not something, you know, bad that he's or she is trying to do, it's just a question. But yet, sometimes, because of our past, we have this impression, and we have this feeling, and this thought that we have. Um, so here, the children of Israel um, are being led away in captivity to Babylon, and Jeremiah writes a letter to them, the prophet, and he says this in Jeremiah 29, 4 through 11. And I'm reading out of the voice. He says this. This is what the eternal commander of heavenly armies and God of Israel says to those ex he exiled from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses, make homes for your families because you are not coming back to Judah anytime soon. Plant gardens and eat the food you grow there. Marry and have children. Find your wives, um, find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so that they can have children. During these years of captivity, let your families grow and not die out. Pursue the peace and welfare of the city where I sent you into exile. Pray to me, the eternal, for Babylon, because if it has peace, you will live in peace. This is what the eternal commander of heavenly armies of God of Israel says to you. Do not be fooled by the false prophets and the fortune tellers among you. Do not listen to the dreamers or their interpretation of dreams, for I did not send them to you. They are prophesying lies in my name. So says the Eternal. If you want the truth, this is what the Eternal has to say. You will remain in Babylon for 70 years. When that time is over, I will come to you and I will keep my promise of bringing you back home. And here's the key verse. 
For I know the plans I have for you, says the Eternal. Plans for peace and not evil, to give you a future and a hope. Never forget that. And in my Bible, that never forget that's italicized, meaning it's important. Never forget, no matter what situation, you may be carried off to captivity. You may feel like where you are right now is captivity. But he says he knows the plans for peace, not evil, a future and a hope. Never forget that. In the King James, verse 11 reads like this. For I know the thoughts I think towards you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. Now here's what I like about that, and that's kind of something that I've kept close to my heart, is that no matter where I am and what I'm going through and what difficulties may face me, he has an expected end for me. And if he has an expected end for me, he has an expected end for my family, he has an expected end for my children, He has an expected end for all of those that attend church together and we work together. He has an expected end for us. Now, ultimately, we know that end is is heaven, right? We all know that that that's what we are preparing for is, is eternity with him. But I think he also has an expectation of what there is for us here now today. Think about this. Think about Joseph. You know, he's somebody that... You know, I've always kind of admired and, and liked and as a Bible uh, character and as a person that's lived in this life. Joseph's past was to constantly be taken advantage of. You know, he is given a vision, a dream that could have taken his brothers who knows where, but out of their jealousy and envy, they got angry and they throw him into a pit. Now, not for one brother, he would have been killed, but one brother was fortunate enough to have enough foresight to put him in a pit and not kill him and have to have that on their hands. And then they sold him into slavery, right? And in slavery, he, you know, what does it say in the Bible? What did he tell the children of Israel when they were in captivity to do what? Marry, get houses, plant. That means live. Live your life as I expect you to live it where you are. That's what he told them to go do. In the midst of Babylon, in the midst of a foreign land, in the midst of a a, a country that took them over, instead of fighting against them, he told them to live at peace, but to continue to exist so that you don't die out. So Joseph goes to Potiphar's house and exists and does and uses the skills and the talents that he was given, and he rises to the top only to be betrayed again. Not just being betrayed by Potiphar's wife, who falsely accused him, But he was betrayed by Potiphar himself, who he had made very wealthy. So he got betrayed twice and thrown into a prison again. And then in this prison, he's there, he again, what does he do? He continues to do the things, use his skills and talents. He didn't complain. He didn't sit around. I'm sure there were days that he struggled. I'm sure there were days that he called out to God, what are you doing? Do you really know what you've got going on? What happened to that dream that you gave me so many years ago? I don't, you know, I don't see it being fulfilled. I don't see it happening. How is it going to happen? How is it going to be fulfilled here? I'm sure there were those times, but he would say, no no different than Christ. Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane said to God, if there's any way for this cup to pass from me, let it pass. But what did he say at the end of that prayer? Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done, right? Nevertheless, I'm going to walk and live the life that, I'm in, that is in front of me to have the expected end that you want me to have. So then the cupbearer and the, and the butler or the cook, the baker, the baker and the cupbearer come and have dreams, and Joseph interprets those dreams, and what does he ask them to do? The cupbearer, what? Remember me, right? Don't forget me. Get me out of this place, right? How many years was it from the time that he interpreted that dream to the time that he was remembered? Two years. Two more years. So wherever you are today, whatever that situation is that Christ has you in and you think, I can't bear it any longer, you may give up. Joseph could have given up and said, I'm done with all of this. But just two years, do you know how fast two years goes by? Trust me, when you get older, it goes by even faster. Okay? 
I think part of it is because you're slower and you can't get there as quickly. So it takes longer to get. I mean, I think I lose half a day just going to the bathroom and getting my face shaved and get my coffee in the morning. I mean, it's just like, I don't know. It just, you know, used to just, you know, you used to move like that. My, my dad used to always get on to me because um, he would get mad because I'd go to the refrigerator. I'm one of those, I'd fly in from outside. I'm going to get some Kool-Aid or some, something out of the refrigerator. I'd fly the door open and stuff come flying out. And I'd have to put it all back in there. And my dad would say, just slow down. Now I wish I would have slowed down more then. Maybe I'd be faster now. I don't know. So in every place that Joseph found himself, he prospered. He never accepted that that is where he was going to end and the story was going to be done there. But he believed that it was important to understand what makes a difference in breaking the chains of your past is how do you live in the here and now? Does your past define you? Does your past define you? You know, he easily could believe that I'm going to be betrayed again, right? Because his past told him he was going to be betrayed again every time he was going to be betrayed. But he didn't trust in his past. He trusted in the eternal. He trusted in his God. He trusted in the hope that he gave him, that he told him, I have an end for you. I have an expectation for you. I have a purpose for you. And that's what he put his trust in. And he lived and he existed and he did the things that he needed to do. Jeremiah, again, told those to continue with their lives, buy your houses, plant gardens. Sometimes when we've been disadvantaged, when we've made a mistake, okay, sometimes mistakes happen because of our own fault. Sometimes mistakes happen because of life and nothing to do with us. Um, whatever the case may be, don't stop right there and just give up. Throw your hands up. But continue to live a life pursuing God. The key to not letting the change of your past choke you is to never forget the promise of verse 11. For I know the plans I have for you, says the eternal, plans for peace, not evil, to give you a future and a hope. Never forget that. Never forget that. If you walk out of here this morning and you can't remember anything else, please never forget he has a plan. He does not desire evil for you. He has a hope and a future. There's three ways we can break free from the chains of your past. Number one, we have to understand we do not control all the circumstances. So for you control freaks out there, you got to let go. Okay? Um, I don't consider myself a huge control freak, but... There was times when I look at what I do and I go, oh, yeah, I guess that was a little bit of controlling. Um, it's tough. I mean, you know, you when you're put in charge of something and you expect to get to this point and you want people to participate, sometimes it's hard to let go and let people develop and become who they, want, they need to become. You want to control everything and, and make it happen. Um, you don't control all the circumstances. Circumstances, life is going to happen to you. Okay, it's going to happen. You do not control them. But there is someone who takes all those things. Go to Romans 8, 28. I'll give you a few moments to get there. So we cannot control every situation. We sometimes will make a bigger mess when we try to control the situation. You know, David made a mistake, right? He got out on the roof in the time that he knew there would be some views you know some nice views one of those views caught his attention real well he invited that sunset into his house a rendezvous so to speak then the mistake happened circumstances occurred right it was just one time so then what he do control the circumstances didn't he He called home her husband, hoping that that would solve his problem. And he refused to go to the house. He stayed outside of the king's palace with his men. He would not go to her during wartime. So now he had a bigger problem. He had to control that. He committed murder by putting him out on the front line, right? But his past didn't stay there, did it? Okay? Romans 8.28 says this, And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. 
So even in David's life, his own fault, his own manipulation of circumstances, God still took that and created good out of that. He still allowed and worked in a way that there was an expected end for himself, for Bathsheba, and for uh, their son Solomon. There was an end to all of that. It doesn't matter what got you to the place where you are. Your faults, not your fault, lies, slander, someone else's failure. It does not matter. We must understand that all things, all things... Scripture didn't say some of these things, only things that weren't your fault. It doesn't say any of that. It says all things work together uh, for good to those who love God. So number one, you got to love God, okay? And to those who are called according to, the, to his purposes. So you know that you live your life for his purposes and for his reasons and for him, and you love him because of that, he will work all those things out. So number one, to break the chains is we don't control all the circumstances. Okay. Number two, walk in an expectation of what God is doing. Walk in an expectation of what God is doing. Hebrews 13, 5 through 6. I'll give you a couple of moments to get there. You know, sometimes when we get in these circumstances, and I, I'm the type that if it's, if it's my fault, it's more difficult. I can give a lot of grace and a lot of love and a lot of compassion and forgiveness to those people that do me wrong, but I really struggle when I mess up myself, when I make the mistake. I'm really hard on myself because I feel like I should have been better than that. I shouldn't have done that. Look who I've hurt. Look who I've let down. And it's very difficult for me to forgive myself. And some of you may be in that situation. But I have to let that go and know that God's got it. He's going to make it work all right. Yes, I blew it. Yes, I've got to go and confess and live with some of the circumstances of that. But going forward, I need to walk in an expectation of what God is doing so I can see and be aware and be ready. And it says this in Hebrews 13, 5 through 6, and the voice says, Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have because he has said, I will never leave you. I will always be by your side. Because of this promise, we may boldly say, the Lord is my help. I won't be afraid of anything. How can anyone harm me? See, that's walking in an expectation that God's going to work all things out. He's going to take care of things because I have a firm belief in him and that what can harm me? If God be for me, who can be against us? And so we have to understand that he has an expected end for you. He has a purpose. And even in those shortfalls where they happen in your life, which they will, they've happened to every character in the Bible. And we're going to talk about a couple of more at the end that had a choice to make. One of them, the chains crushed him and killed him. And the other one, the chains set him free to become one of the greatest. And we're going to look at this and we're going to understand that if we know that one that he has an expected end for you. That we can not control the circumstances. And when they occur and when they happen, trust God. And then turn with this expectation that he's going to be for us. And he's going to take that. We can't fall in love. Now, there was a time when those children in, in captivity had to leave. He told them build houses, gardens, do the marrying and the giving. All those things he told them to do. But they always did all of that with the thought and the knowledge that they were living at that moment in a expectation of what God was doing for an expected end that they would be able to return home to Jerusalem. So they never lost sight of what their promise was. Joshua 1, 6 through 9 says this. So be strong and courageous, for you will lead this people as they acquire and then divide the land I promised to their ancestors. Always be strong and courageous and always live by all the law I gave to my servant Moses, never turning from it, even ever so slightly, so that you may succeed wherever you go. Let the words from the book of the law be always on your lips. Meditate on them day and night so that you may be careful to live by all that is written in it. If you do, as you make your way through this world, you will prosper and always find success. Okay, did anybody catch that? That's a key for your living says, if you do, as you make your way through this world, you will prosper and find success. 
Verse 9, this is my command. Be strong and courageous. Never be afraid or discouraged because I am your God, the eternal one. And I will remain with you wherever you go. No matter how deep and how dark your past pulls you down, that is not where you're going to end. And the beauty in it, and this is the part we struggle with, I struggle with. He's right there in that pit with Joseph. He didn't leave Joseph when Joseph was thrown in the pit. He was right there at Potiphar's house the whole time with Joseph. He was in that prison with Joseph the whole time. Never left him. Always encouraging him. Bringing him to an expected end. Be strong and courageous. My word for some of you today who have been going through battles with your past and and whatever that may be, controlling something that maybe has controlled your past and controlling you now and you can't seem to shake it. Be strong and courageous. Meditate on his word. You know, when he talks about here, meditate on them day and night, he's talking about the word, the book of the law, the word. Meditate, be in the presence of the Lord. You know, that's the importance of worship is it prepares us as we meditate and focus on him and and put the past, put all those circumstances and things that happened this morning and the week before and the weeks before that, put them all out for a moment and just get in the presence of the Lord and let him begin to be able to speak to us. So to break these chains of our past, we cannot, I got to understand we can't control the circumstances. You have to expect, live in an expectation of what God is doing, trusting in him, not getting discouraged, but being strong because he's going to be with you. And last, we trust in the Lord. Trust in the Lord. He directs the path of those who place their trust in him. Proverbs 3, 5 through 6, a verse that many people recognize, says, Place your trust in the eternal. Rely on him completely. Never depend upon your own ideas and inventions. Give him the credit for everything you accomplish, and he will smooth out and straighten the road that lies ahead. Put your trust in him. Give him credit. And he will direct and he will straighten out that path you're to walk. How many times have you said, Lord, where do I go? Where do I turn? What do I do? Trust him. Give him credit. And as you start down that path that looks like this, and you don't know how and where it's going to end or what's around the curve, he's going to straighten it out. He's going to give you wisdom. He's going to give you knowledge and the ability to be successful. Even though that past is down there trying to reach up and grab you and pull you back down, keep moving forward. He rewards those who diligently seek him, Hebrews eleven six. 6. Without faith, no one can please God because the one coming to God must believe he exists and he rewards those who come seeking. So you've got to put your trust in him. He's going to reward you. And then give God all the credit and the glory due his wonderful name. Ephesians 3.20 through 21. The doxology says this. Now to the God who can do so many awe-inspiring things, immeasurable things, things greater than we could ever ask or imagine through the power at work in us. Now when he does these things, who did he say he did those things through? Let me read it to you again. Let me let that sink in for a second. Now to the God who can do so many awe-inspiring things, immeasurable things, things greater than we could ever ask or imagine, through the power at work in us. I think that's you and me. This morning I was talking with, um, and I've already forgot her name. Anyhow, and I said to him, (laughs) I'm going to put name tags on on y'all because... And, and she said that, you know, her, you know, they said, that, well, now we're part of the group because you called us us. Um, and I didn't think about that at the time until they said that. But us is all of us. Okay? It's all of us that gather and call on the name of the Lord. Call him Lord. 
They may look different than us. They may worship a little bit different. We were at a church yesterday, and, and they worship a little bit different. They do things a little differently. But guess what? If the God is the God of them, then they are us. And God does awe-inspiring things through all of us. All of us. You're a part of that. Even with your past, you are a part of that. That past does not hold you. It does not define you. It does not make you less or unworthy. Give him the glory and the credit Do his name. To him be all glory in the church and in Jesus the anointed from this generation to the next forever and ever. Amen. Forever and ever. Amen. So breaking those chains of our past, we recognize that he has an expected end for every one of you here today. And anyone listening via video, he has an expected end for you. So we break these chains of the past by not letting our understanding that our circumstances, we can't control them. We can't go back and redo the past. We can't go back and change it. It's happened. We cannot control every circumstance we're going to face. But we can walk with an expectation that God is going to do what he says he's going to do. We can walk and we can live and you can find life and you can find joy in the place you're in, even in the, the difficulties and then we have to trust in the Lord. I want to give you an example as we prepare to kind of take this full circle. Two people made the mistake. Two people that walked with Jesus knew him better than any of us in this room could ever know him. Broke bread with him. Peter and Judas. Peter, headstrong, get himself in a mess, in a hurry. But full of the love of, of God, loved God, loved Jesus. Defended him, wanted to defend him in every situation. I mean, they come to the garden and what does he do? He pulls a sword. I'm going to defend you. But he also was told, you're going to deny me. No, not me, Lord. Remember, I'm Peter the rock. I'm the one that said to you, you are the, the beloved, the Messiah. And you told me that flesh and blood, had, you know, you put a special seal on me. I won't deny you. Huh. Interesting. Now, he knew that he was going to deny him. He knew he was going to deny him when he told him he was now the rock. He knew he was going to deny him when he called him out of the boat on the seashore. He already knew all of that. But it never stopped him from calling Peter to work with him. To learn, to be a part of the ministry and the calling. Never stopped him. By the same token, he also knew Judas. He knew what Judas was going to do. He knew the type of person Judas was. And even knowing all of that, he put him in charge of the money. He could have chosen someone else to be in charge of the money. He knew Judas was going to go betray him. The night that he went, he gave him a kiss and go do what you've got to do. Now here's the difference. When Peter got into the courtyards and denied Christ and ran out and realized what he had done, Peter was broken by that. It, it, you know, How could I have done this? How could I, the rock who had walked with Christ and defended him, how could I have let this happen to me? The circumstances of that situation, his past all of a sudden was coming up. You're just a hothead. You're never going to amount to anything. You're not any good. You know, all of these things that were in his past were, were rising up. Now, here's something interesting. And I didn't pull the scripture this morning. I apologize. Um, but in our readings we've been having recently, if you follow us along with on the, devotion, on the daily devotional, there was a, a portion of scripture that talked about when Jesus reappeared after he rose from the tomb, he appeared to the twelve. Think about that for a moment. Now, if Judas had already hung himself, there wouldn't have been twelve. Right? Even though Peter had failed, he still was with the twelve. So they were both there when Jesus came back to them 
and said, it's all good, guys. It's okay. What you did and what you thought you did, it's okay. It was God's great plan. There's an expected end. Peter received that, and Peter turned his life and, and got forgiveness. And then Peter's expected end was to be one of the greatest disciples we had. If I read Revelation properly, Peter will have a seat in the throne because of his faithfulness. But Judas couldn't bear his past. He couldn't trust the Lord anymore. His failure was too great. He couldn't live with an expectation that God still had everything for him. He had ruined the circumstances and he didn't see a path to get back. The only path he saw was to end it. Two people who had a similar past, a past of denying God, denying Christ, denying his power, but two totally different outcomes in how they lived. I got five steps. Unfortunately, they're not going to be up there. The musicians, if you want to come on back up, I'll have to give you time to write them down. Number one, our past does not have to dictate our future. Our past does not have to dictate our future. One more. Our past does not have to dictate our future. Number two, understand that you will never be able to control all the circumstances. Understand that you will never be able to control all the circumstances. Number three, walk with an expectation of what God is going to do through you. Walk in his promises. Walk with an expectation of what God is going to do through you. Walk in his promises. Number four, trust completely in God. Not our wisdom, skills, or talents alone. Recognize he gave them to us for his ultimate plan. So trust God. Trust God completely in God. Not our wisdom, skills, or talents alone. Recognize he gave them to us for his ultimate plan. So trust God. And five, give God the glory at all times and in all circumstances, remembering he has an expected end for us all. Give God the glory at all times and in all circumstances, remembering he has an expected end for us all. You're watching a message from Connect Church of Jacksonville. Find us online at connectchurchjax.org.